I didn't even know I wasn't on. Okay. So the question, the, the, God's sovereignty is so good and it's so prevalent because everything that has happened in the last week uh, kind of leads up to this parable. And this last week has been crazy, hasn't it, in our country and in our state? But it leads up to this last week. And the reason is because it answers this one question. And this question that it answers is, what do we do with our time on this earth? What do we do with the time that we have on this earth? Before Christ returns, before we die, I mean, it's been, it's been chaos, right? This last week especially, all sorts of... Um, Issues with racial injustices and abusive power, people screaming and uh, destroying property and teams boycotting and all the things that you've seen all the while we are dealing with COVID. We had a couple hurricanes in there. We got these, the, the election coming up. And by the way, you probably know this, hopefully by now. It doesn't even matter who you vote for. Half the country is going to be terribly upset, right? We got a lot going on. And maybe the question for all of us to consider is, what do we do with our time? We are living, as Chaz mentioned earlier, uh, in an age of outrage. And so we're doing this series in two weeks. It's the age of outrage. How do we thrive in these conditions? Because it's not by accident that you are here, and it's not by accident that you are alive and I am alive in this moment, in this world. We are here for a reason. If God wanted you to be born in the 1800s and be a cowboy, he would have had that happen, right? But you are here right now in 2020. If you are alive and breathing, you are here, okay? So um, what do we do with our time? And I don't know about you, but people, I think, are wondering, how do you respond? And they're so angry. Like yesterday, I was walking into Walmart and... The worker on the, the outside, you know, welcoming people to come in, just politely asked somebody, sir, do you have a mask? It was right in front of me. And he just, just threw up his mask and, and kind of, you know, almost just, I thought he was going to knock him out. I'm like, man, listen, we, there's a lot of angry people out there, right? Have, have you seen any angry people this, this week? And so um, how do we handle that. Last week, what we talked about is these 10 bridesmaids and their lamps. Remember that? Five were prepared, five were not prepared. Five were prepared for Christ's return, five ran out of oil, and when they went to replenish and get some more oil, the bridegroom, which is Jesus, returned. They weren't ready. They missed out. Well, today what we're going to do is we're going to pick up right where we left off after that. Jesus goes into another parable, and this is, again, one of the most popular parables of all time. And I don't know if you remember this, but what we did was in May, we invited you to give us the parables that you wanted us to talk about throughout the summer. So then we developed a schedule based on your input. And so one of the most popular parables that was suggested out of all of them is the one that we are going to use here for the finale of this series, and it is the parable of the talents, which teaches us what to do with the time that we have left on this earth. How do we spend it? What does it look like? And the good news is that Jesus gave us specific instructions on that and, what, and, and how to handle that. See, When I became a Christian, I used to think in my early years that that being a Christian meant that you you recognize you're a sinner, right? Your sin separates me from God. My sin separates me from God. And I don't deserve to go to heaven. But when I accept Christ as my Savior, I enter into his family. He forgives me of my sin And I begin a relationship with him. Would you agree with that? Isn't that what a Christian means? I I think so. But what I didn't realize is that's the beginning part. See, we we need to transition from, Lord, I need you. That was the Lord, I need you phase. Lord, I need you. Come into my life and forgive me of my sins. What we do now, if that's happened in your life, we move to another phase two, I guess you could call it, which is, Lord, I trust you. You see, that would go from, Lord, I need you, 
to, Lord, I trust you. God, I want to trust you with my life. I want to trust you with, with, with everything that I have. I want to be used by you. I'm going to trust my life into your hands. And that's what this parable really gets at. And if you come to this point where you've started your journey with God, and we have these three S words we talk about quite a bit. I'll show them to you on the screen. Uh, the three S words are, start, well, it's the word, those are the icons, start, strengthen, and Share your journey with God. So we start our journey with God. You can see the little seeds going into the soil. We strengthen our journey with God. It's growing. And we share our journey with God. So three S's. Now, once you have started your journey with God, then the question is, what do we do from there? What does it look like? Because you and I are not meant to just take up space on this earth. We are not meant to just say, yay, I get to go to heaven when I die, so I can just do anything I want. I can live any way I want. I mean, if that was the case, God would have just taken us right up to heaven as soon as you accepted Christ, right? But he didn't. And what, what are we supposed to do in the meantime? It's, it's not, our lives are not about fulfilling what I want and fulfilling my needs or getting rich or being famous or entertaining myself or just doing things that try to fulfill my own happiness. That's not what my life is about ultimately. It's something different. I created another graphic here I want to show you. And uh, I think I've showed this to you before, but imagine that this is an illustration of our lives. On the left side is what happened, is, is the day we were born, and on the right side is the day we die. And somewhere in between that, we'll say a little off to the middle, is a cross, and that is the moment you do the first S, which is start your journey with God. You, you, you accept Christ into your life. This is the Lord, I need you phase. I, I need you. I want to be forgiven. I want to start a new, a new life. Now, what happens between that cross and the day you die, that's up to you. And that's up to me. What we do between those in that phase is our responsibility. And it's not about just our own happiness. It's not about uh, just, just what we want to do. Getting, squeezing the most out of life that we can. It's much more nobler than that. It's much more important than that. So we have this kingdom work that God calls us to do. And once you get, when you start figuring this out between the cross and death, then what happens is we start living in the second phase, which is, Lord, I trust you. We go from, Lord, I need you, to, Lord, I trust you. Okay? So, what do we do between now and then? Jesus tells this parable, one of the most beloved and impactful parables of all. Let's read it. It's in Matthew 25, starting in verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent. Each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, let's talk through each of these scenarios here. The first person we need to understand is the master. And what do we know about the master? We know that the master is very wealthy. The master is rich. The master has all sorts of property and assets. And what he did was he entrusted those assets and that property to his servants. Now we know that Jesus, you know, this is a parable, right? Jesus is the master, in case you're wondering who the master is. He owns everything. He has enormous eternal wealth, not necessarily money, just he, he's God, right? He has everything. The talents, a talent in the Bible is a, is a weight of measure and, and money. And so basically uh, one talent in today's 
value would be well over a million dollars. We'll just say it's about a million dollars just for simplicity's sake, okay? So what happened is Jesus is saying, what he, what he does is he gives one servant, uh, servant number one, five talents, or maybe five million dollars, and then the second service, servant, two talents, or maybe two million dollars, and the third servant, one talent, or maybe about one million dollars, okay? So in verse 15, this is so important because it says that the servants were given the talents. Now listen to this. It says, each according to his ability. Now why is that important? Well, it, we recognize that God, God recognizes that each person is unique, that each person is an individual, and that each person, it's not like everybody's equal, like everybody gets the exact same amount, right? So God knows, he wires us, he, he knows where we're at, and he, what, what's important is he calls each of us to be faithful with whatever we do have. It doesn't mean serving Jesus is easy, it just means that he gives us the ability to do what he calls us to do. And remember, we're going from I need you to I trust you, okay? So the master gives each servant a great amount of money, some more than others according to his ability, and then he leaves on a trip. In other words, this is a parable. Jesus goes up to heaven, and he says, you are responsible. You are the servants, okay? So servant number one, he doubled it up. He had five talents, doubled it up to ten, Servant number two, he had two talents, doubled it up to four. Servant number three dug a hole and he hid his talent in the ground. He did nothing with it. So number one and number two had the same response. They did something significant with what they have been given. Notice they received the same reward even though they were given different amounts. So it's not the amounts that's important. It's what we do with what we have been given that is important. Finally, in this parable, the master comes back, and of course, symb symbolic of Jesus returning. When Jesus returns, the day he, he returns in all of his glory, um, he, he has a, a response for each of these, sermon, these servants, okay? Let's pick it up in verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master rep replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Again, servant number one took what he had. He was faithful. He doubled it. Servant number two took what he had. He was faithful. He doubled it. The two servants enjoyed the affirmation of the master. The master was kind. And, and they notice it says that they shared in the joy now, I think this is worth just pondering just for a moment because we try so hard to find joy and happiness and contentment. We want so badly to, to experience that, and yet the greatest way we can experience that is not in trying so hard, like killing ourselves to try to have more stuff. It's when we are good managers of what he has given to us. God, I trust you. Use me. In other words, trying to live a life of fulfillment in yourself, it doesn't work. And maybe you're here and you're like, well, I, I just want to be happy. I'm going to get all the things I can, do all the things I can, and I'm gonna, my life is about me, and I'm going to fill myself up because I want to be happy. And I'll tell you what, it just never really works, does it? What well, works is when you have the power and the work of Christ working through us, he brings fulfillment. He brings satisfaction. These servants did something significant with what they had been given. Let's go to servant number three. What did he do? Verse 24. 
Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Now, at first glance, you read this, you're like, well, that doesn't sound so bad, right? I mean, at least he didn't lose it. <laughs> at least he didn't do something reckless with it. But you know what he did? He made excuses. He made excuses. His responsibility was to serve the master. And he didn't do that. Imagine if I gave you a million dollars and you literally buried it in the ground. You didn't do anything. I mean, at least you didn't lose it. You buried it in the ground. If I told you, do something good with this million dollars. And you literally went and buried it in your backyard. That's maybe the idea here. Servant number three it's important to understand this, that he had a faulty view of God. And what I mean by that, this is someone who looks like a Christian, acts like a Christian, maybe grew up going to church, but isn't really connecting the dots. They're not really getting it. They're not really, they're, they're not really genuine in what their faith. They put on behaviors, but they're not really genuine. And Jesus, again, in many of the parables, he talked about these types of people. He talked about the wheat and the tares, the good and the bad, the wise and the foolish, the faithful and the unfaithful, the different soils. But eventually, who we are ends up leaking out of us, right? It's like, imagine, yeah, imagine you had someone over for dinner, right? Wouldn't you like to have somebody over for dinner once in a while? Okay, we will. We'll get there. But let, let's, let's change it to imagine you had friends over for the weekend. And before your friends arrive for the weekend, you are like, okay, everybody, kids, you know, you say to your spouse, we got to get our house ready. Okay, you, you're going to vacuum. You, you're going to dust. You, we're, we're going to pick up all our stuff. We're going to clean. We're going to get ready. We have company coming, and we got to be done at 5 o'clock on Friday. They're staying for the weekend. And by the way, you know, you guys be on your best behavior. You know, I don't want any bodily functions or anything else happening while we have company. We're going to put on our best face as a family, right? Okay, so... You could do that. You could do that for, for a weekend. But what if the guest said, oh, you know what? We, you know, this thing happened. We need a place to stay. Do you mind if we stay a month? Well, all of a sudden, you can't keep up that pace for a month. Things are going to start leaking out. Who you are, you're going to leave messes. Things are going to get dirty. You know, it, it's just, it, you can't do that. I think in a way, maybe that's what Jesus is getting at. You can look and act like a Christian for a while, but eventually, over time, who you are is going to leak out. And servant number three, this is what's happening to him, okay? Servant number three looked like a servant. He looked like he loved the master, but over time, his actions showed that he didn't really love the master in this parable. How do we know that? He said, I knew you were a hard man. Those are his words. He was covering up the irresponsibility that he had. He was making excuses for not being responsible to do what the master had asked him to do. And he didn't, probably didn't really believe that the master was actually going to return. I mean, he's kind of like, okay, yeah, yeah, well, you know, at the beginning, well, you go on your way, have a good time, I'll take care of things here. He probably didn't believe that the master was actually and literally going to come back. So the master had some harsh words for the servant. And this is, this is again, the parables are kind of hard sometimes, but um, here's the hard part of the parable, verse 26. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. 
For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Servant number three represents someone who isn't really a Christian, but looks and acts like a Christian, talks like a Christian, understands the lingo, the language, and Jesus calls him worthless and lazy. And you might think, again, well, that's kind of harsh, isn't it? But think of it this way, okay? If you had someone that you loved, let's say you had someone you just really, really, really loved, and over time, uh, that person decided that they don't really love you back. Some of you understand the heartbreak of that. And you, they just, they're just like, I want to do my own thing. I don't want to have a relationship with you. I don't love you. Uh, I, you know, I think you're fine. You're nice. But I just don't want to. I'm not there. Well, what do you do? Eventually, if you have no control and you can control what you can control, right, you let them go. I think there's a similar concept with God. Because here's the deal. People will all, over and over, they'll say to God, I don't care about what you really think, God. I want to live my own life. I want to do my own thing. I want to live and do and, and just have fun. And I'm not worried. I, I don't really care. I don't really believe the Bible. I don't really, under, I don't get or understand or believe all the claims that you made. So I am going to do my own thing. And you can do your thing. And we, we think that's, that's what settles it. Well, that's kind of what's happening here. Finally, God says, Jesus says, you know what? If that's the way you want to do it, you can do it. But if it's not the way, you know, I'm going to let you go. I'm not going to force you to be my follower. So, if you choose... To follow me, it's like Jesus saying, you get to this point where you say, not only do you say, I need you, but eventually you say, I trust you. I'm going to trust you with my life. Which one's easier to say to God, I need you or I trust you? <laughs> I trust you. Is, or it's harder to say, I trust you, right? It's easier to say, I need you. But when we get to that point where we say, I trust you, God, it's almost like his joy, his blessing, his favor, it just all comes together. And it's so powerful. You begin to experience a joy like you've never had. I think the reason um, that, 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 that so many people are wrestling in life is because we haven't come to a point where we said, I'm trusting you, God. I'm going to trust you. Okay. So question for you, which of the three servants are you like? That's kind of the hard question, right? That's the point that Jesus is getting them to think about. Obviously, none of us want to be like servant number three. We want to be like servant number one or two. One who had five talents, did something with it, doubled it up, ten talents. One who had two, two, number two who had two talents, doubled it up, had four talents. So we take what we've been given and we do something significant with it. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but um, how many of you like a good old-fashioned bag of, of goodies, right? A nice present. Anybody like presents? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. When you, when you come to the point where you accept Christ into your life, I don't know if you realize this, you've been given a present, many presents, gifts. And as a part of... Uh, of that point where you come to say, I need you, um, we have gifts that we have been given. And specifically, I want to share with you what a few of these gifts are, okay? First gift that we've been given is the gift of time. Not a clock, but time. <laughs> we are given this gift of time. And time is so important because you know what? Um, you can always get more money. but you can never get more time, right? If you had to get more money, you could get more money. You could get another job. You could do whatever. You can, you can do something. You can never, ever get more time. And so 
Time is a gift. It's way more important than money. And I wonder how much time we waste these days, especially as we're kind of in some kind of quarantine and supposed to be careful and how much time we spend on social media and playing video games and all sorts of other things, right? And I'm not blaming anyone. I'm not casting judgment. I'm just saying, myself included, we all probably waste a significant amount of time. Time is one of the most precious things that we could ever have. And so many of us, we get thinking, I mean, I'm thinking to myself, okay, uh, Becky and I have been married for 22 years, and I think, where did the time go? <laughs> we have uh, three kids, uh, 19, 17, and almost 14, and if you have kids, you get to the point, you're like, where did the time go? Right? Our church started like 16 years ago, I look back in those early days when I had more hair and it wasn't gray, and I think, where did the time go? Time is precious. But you know what's going to happen? You know, if you were to really listen closely, you can hear a clock ticking. There comes a point where eventually the clock stops ticking. I'm going to pull this battery out. And then it's over. Our time on earth is done. And the question is, what do we do with the time that we have on this earth? It's like, you could ask anybody like, you could ask somebody, the oldest person you know, they would say, I can't believe how quickly the time went by. Again, you and I, we're alive. If you're here, your heart is beating, you're watching online, we're here for a reason. This is our time. And we're not here to waste it. It's hard. We all get it. It's hard. We're not here to waste the opportunity that we have with our time. So that's one of the gifts that we have. Let me see what else is in here. This one's going to surprise you. Look at this. A basketball. I got this email. This is like a month ago. Okay, I got this email. Guess who it was from? The Milwaukee Bucks. And they're like, we want you. I'm like, now you're talking. That's right. <laughs> Picturing myself next to Giannis, you know, and we're you know, dynamic duo. We want you. And then it went on to talk about, you know, being a good fan and all that. I'm like, but you know what? It got me thinking. We have different gifts. We have different skills. My skill is not to be a professional basketball player. But we have other gifts. Uh, you, maybe you have other skills like... Maybe you're handy. Yeah, there we go. A little... A little grunting, Tim the Toolman. Okay. Um, let's see. Others of you might have other skills like, you know, music or singing or maybe speaking. These are just samples. The point is, every single one of us, if you've started your journey with God, you have some kind of skill and ability to do something significant during your time. So God not only gives you time... He gives you skills and abilities to use for his kingdom while you have this time on this earth. So not only is it like, okay, you got time. You're like, well, what do I do? He empowers you with these skills and gifts and abilities to do something significant. Do you think that right now when the church, when the world around us needs the church the most is the time that we withdraw our gifts and talents and abilities, the world is crying out for help. They need the gospel. They need Jesus. So we, it is so important for us to use whatever God has given to us for his glory. Now, churches around the country are struggling, and you probably know this. On average, well, you may not know this, but on average, there's a, a 3,500 churches that close its doors every year. And before this pandemic, there was about that amount, maybe 4,000, 
of churches that were being planted. So, but even with the population growth, I mean, it's, we still don't have nearly enough churches in this country. But did you know this, that in the midst of this pandemic, this year, the projections are that 8,000 churches are going to be closing its doors because of everything that's going on. 8,000 churches. That's more than, it's almost triple what normally would, would close. And church planting to try to compensate for that, that is way down. Okay. So we're stable, we're growing, but we need every single person to use our gifts and abilities with the time that we've been given to serve our God. Okay? Don't bury it. Now, the last gift I have here in my bag is my own wallet, okay? My own, my own finances, my own, my own money here. And this is my, I would be absolutely foolish, wouldn't I, to say, you know what? This, this is all me. This is all this belongs to me. This is mine. We know from this parable that we are called, I am called to manage what I've been given. To manage it. To do it well. You know that 40% of the parables in in the Gospels, 40% of them are all about money and possessions and how we handle money and possessions, 40% of it. And in this parable, the first two servants, they did a great job. They're like, you know what? This is not mine. This is not mine. I am called to manage what I've been given, okay? And so the master commends them as we talked about. But the third servant, you know what he did? took a shovel, and he dug a hole, and he just put it in the ground. And nothing good was used because of him bearing what he's been given. Nothing good happened. At Journey and at many Christian um, financial planners and so forth, they talk about the 10-10-80 plan. You take your first 10%, you give it back to God in the place that you worship. That's what, that's what a tithe is about. You take the second 10% and you, you give it basically to yourself in a savings or, or in retirement to prepare for the future or in an emergency account. And you live off the 80%. It's called the 10-10-80 principle. Okay? That's why we say at Journey we give first to honor God. We save second to build margin. We live off the rest to learn to be content. Okay? Maybe, and I want to be careful because I know these are hard times. Maybe you're here and you're having a hard time. Maybe your job is unstable. Maybe you're having difficulty getting back. We, we actually want to help you in any way that we can. We want to help you learn the principles of how to budget. We want to help you get started with getting how to, a plan to get out of debt. Whatever we can do to help you. But if you, if you have a steady income and you have been... Um, God's blessed you with your job and so forth, uh, listen, then maybe it's time for you to use the 10, 10, 80 principle to go from I need you to I trust you, specifically with our resources, and say, God, use this for your glory. The world needs you. The gospel needs to go forward, okay? So that's the idea. Um, here's the point. We have all been given. We've all been given time. We've all been given talents, skills. We've all been given different amounts of, of a treasure. And the question is, what will we do with what it is we've been given? It's not the amount or the skill. It's not what it is and how much. That, not, that doesn't really matter. It's what do we do with what we have not what we don't have. Because most people think, yeah, well, if I get rich, then I'll start getting, you know. What, if we start now with what we do have, okay. I want to tell you something, and this is, and I just really thought of this, <laughs> this a little bit ago. The world needs the, the church, meaning not just our church. The world needs the church to be strong in this time that we live in 
right now. Green Bay and De Pere needs our church to be strong. Now more than ever, because here's the thing. The next president is not going to save our world, right? I mean, the next, uh, the, the, even a vaccine for COVID is not going to solve all the world's problems. Aligning ourselves with one organization or the other is not the, the, the solution to all the problems we have in this world. But we do have the solution. The solution is Jesus Christ. And we as the church represent Jesus Christ. He gave the church to the world. And he said, I am the head of the church. And you are the body of Christ. And in order for the church to be the church in the world we live in. That's why Jesus told this parable. He said, you know what? You have been given time and talents and treasures. What if you use them for the purposes of God to use between that point of the cross and the day you die? The world needs the gospel. We are the church. Christ is the head of his church. Which servant will you be like? Don't be caught burying your treasure, especially in a time like now. So let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Give me one second. <laughs> Father, thank you for your goodness. You have blessed us in so many ways. Forgive us, Lord, for bearing our treasures, for cowering in fear, for trusting solely in people or organizations. We need you, and our world needs you. Our community needs you. I need you. So God, may your church shine brightly in a dark world. I thank you that there's so many people who are searching and working and looking for hope. You've given us hope. And you've promised that you'll be with us. I pray that we would transition from I need you to I trust you. Help us, Lord, to do that for your glory and in your name. Amen. All right, thank you. Let's stand. We have one more song that we're going to sing.
There's a lot, a lot of brokenness in our world, a lot of problems, and there's a lot of good things that can be done, but let's not forget the ultimate answer for the problems is Jesus Christ, right? And people always are trying to get us to align to, to certain things, and sometimes that's good, and that's, that there's value to it, but Jesus is the answer. And as a Christian, you represent Jesus Christ. Christ to those around us. And that's what we take into this world. That's our gift. We go into the world as, as a follower of Jesus. So I hope that when your friends and your neighbors and the people you work with, they see you, that they don't really see you. They see Jesus in you. And God would be glorified because of that. Sometimes I'm embarrassed because I don't think people see Jesus in me as much as I would hope. But we start over, we go back to God, and we say, God, would you shine through me, a vessel? And by his grace and his love, he does. So I hope that that's what happens in our lives here today. And we really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Christine and Kevin, thank you guys for coming. Um, next week is, they're going to be with us again next week. Next week is also our outdoor service. Remember to bring your lawn chairs, whatever you want to cook or grill or a bag lunch or whatever you want to do. And we're going to be setting up outdoors, weather permitting. And Journey Kids also has some, uh, some, some great kids activities. So if you're not here because you're kids and you're watching online, please remember uh, we will have specific uh, things for, for your kids uh, next Sunday outdoors. So I hope you can join us as well if you would like to. We are going to be doing a Facebook live stream next week, but it's just kind of like a like the, the simplest thing we can possibly do. So it's not going to have slides and all that like we do while we're in, indoors here. Okay? Um, one last thing, and that is if you could, if you wanted to text us a, uh, just text welcome to that number, 920-315-7789, uh, we will get in touch with you, uh, to give you some information about Journey. We'd love to be able to help you to connect in that way. All right, let's pray. So God, once again, we ask that you would Lead us in the days ahead. Lead us in this week. We have no idea what's going to happen in this next week. It's been, it's been so turbulent of all the things in our world. We need you, God. And we pray that you would shine through us as your people. That we would be faithful. We would be faithful with our time, talents, and treasures to serve you. We love you, God. Lead us as we go. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Have a great week. Well, thank you for coming to today's broadcast and joining us for our service online. Uh, our goal is to help people to start their journey with God, to strengthen their journey with God, and to share their journey with God. And so thank you so much. I hope you're able to do that today. And just a quick reminder as you, uh, before you leave that we have a Connect card. And if you go to our website, journeydepeer.com slash live, you'll see a Connect With Us card. And that's where you can fill out a card online and give us any prayer requests or anything you'd like to share with us. We would appreciate it. We love hearing from people. So thank you for doing that. If you've been blessed by this broadcast, I want to invite you to share it uh, on social media. And, and let others know uh, more about it as well. So thank you again for coming. Hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next week.